just to kind of kick things off, um, give us a little brief summary of the book uh, for folks who haven't had a chance to, to get their hands on it just yet. I'll start with Blake. Go ahead. Sure, sure. Uh, it's it. What we really wanted to do with this book was to gather all of the places in which Dr. Moore has been mentioned in history, um, in in history that exists now and is recorded uh, now prior to this book, and to bring it to a central location where all of those facts and all of those events could then be. Um, kind of mixed into a, a, a recipe with uh, what we bring to the table as family members, as descendants, and our own uh, access to archives and uh, interviews and, and family knowledge to really give him a much more um, three-dimensional warmth. Uh, often some of our, our figure, figures from history, especially from this um, more dignified and, and Victorian period in people's outer uh, uh, comportment, um, we can always get this idea that they are somewhat representational and two-dimensional and, and straight-laced. Um, and I think that what we really wanted was to bring Dr. Moore and his personality and his family life, as well as, as uh, his historic, his place in history, together into one place where someone could really visit with him. And so hmm. that's, this book takes place over, you know, it, it is the timeline of his life, but it is also um, put in the context of, of the greater world history uh, and national history and kind of sets his life in his time so that you can not only feel his personality and, and be with him, but also see who he was as a man of his time, what the, the wins and, and, and issues against which he had to struggle were um, from a bit of a microcosmic and mic macrocosmic view. Excellent. Eileen, you want to add anything to that? No. <laughs> I mean, I thought she encompassed it great. So, she, I mean, if you don't have anything that, that's fine. She knows what the book was about. Um, I don't think I... <laughs> better. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, um, having sort of given that background, and, and especially in terms of positing Dr. Moore's life uh, and the time in, in, upon which he lived. I wonder if you could sort of speak a little bit more about how you feel you successfully sort of merged um, the memoir aspect and the biographical history aspect of the writing of his life. That was definitely a delicate dance um, because a historical biography and a memoir are two pretty different things. And so um, in order to also rise to the academic standard of the University of North Carolina Press, uh, who uh, published this manuscript, we also had had that kind of, and I wanted for him to have that level of gravitas added to his life story. So there is the academic aspect, there's the historic aspect, um, there's the personal aspect, and then I truly wanted it to be readable um, and digestible in a, almost like a piece of music, actually, as a musician, uh, in, in movements, you know, in, uh, in ways that you could um, sit with it either chapter by chapter or be led from chapter to chapter should you want to, to be led all the way through the book. Mm. Um, depending on your on your reading style and your reading uh, availability. Lots of people don't have a ton of time to read anymore. So I wanted people to be able to sit and have small visits with him. And, and I, he also was someone who sat and read every day. So I also kind of had in my imagination the way that he encountered books on a daily basis and, and had daily study. So I really wanted to, to have that feeling to the book 
as as a book that he might have enjoyed sitting down and and reading on a daily basis. So um, I wanted it to have that kind of deliberate flavor and that kind of academic weight, but also the readability. And because of the memoir aspect in the sense that I am a descendant and therefore related to his life, uh, it was, I, I definitely had to make sure that I kept an academic distance. Um, I was certainly admonished to do so uh, in, in my peer reviews by my extraordinary peer reviewers um, and by those who were my guides along the way uh, in, in the editing process. Mm. Uh, and so to show rather than, than tell, to make sure that my love for him didn't, you know, uh, overwhelm the, the factual textual, uh, parts of things and to really trust his story and his, and the rhythm of his story, um, to, to unfold in a way that uh, was was readable um and 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 personal i think mm -hmm. so if mm -hmm. if anything else the the memoir aspect is how personal it is to me and the and the historical biography aspect is uh how important he is as a man in history um and there was there were ways to connect that along the way and i and i tried to do that mm. And, and so speaking of the personal part of it, Eileen, I, I know and I, re, I can recall many years ago and I, I, so that I know that the book took seven years, right, to, right. to, to, yeah. to, to get from start to from A to Z. Yeah. And so Eileen, I, I can recall us talking because um, I arrived at Duke in 2012. Okay. I can't remember the exact year, but I remember we had a, a very early conversation about Mm -hmm. sort of your desire to see this book be created. And I wonder if you could just talk about, especially from the personal standpoint of, you know, how the book came about, you know, what led you along the path to seeing this book through and having it published? That path started way back. <laughs> so initially in, in 2013 was probably... 2012 was probably when we talked because I retired in 2013. Okay. Um, so I began to really think about how to do it about then and realized that I could foster its happening, making it happen. I knew I wasn't going to be the writer. I knew I did know how to fit, raise enough money to maybe bring on a high quality writer. And I retired with in mind that I would um, take over the realm, the helm of uh, Durham Colored Library Inc., knowing that it was kind of under the radar and uh, needed a solid board, a website, you know, just all kinds of things. It had 501c3 status and it had um, one annual, one project and a little bit of annual fund asks, but no big project, no big um, sort of ongoing, uh, highly impactful project. And my dream was to have, raise enough money to have this um, book written. And the board agreed with me. And we kind of got busy trying to find funding and trying to find an author from that time. But the dream of having the book written was from, oh, listening to my grandmother talk about Papa. I grew up with her. She was my grandma, right? Um, my parents lived in her home when they first came back to Durham from Howard. When dad got his uh, uh, surgical residency, he was here uh, mm. to practice at Lincoln Hospital. And um, at that point, he was, of course, building a practice and had two little girls and a wife. And my grandparents, Loudermore Merrick and Ed Merrick had room for us there. So we stayed with them for four years before we built the house that's up near uh, link near um, NCCU. Mm -hmm. um, so my, my mom was busy with my sister, who was Blake's mom, um, who was three years younger than I was. So I was about four years old. And that was when I knew uh, Cotty Moore, who is in this picture behind me. This is Aaron Moore's wife. 
who mm -hmm. lived 20 years after he did, actually. So I, I really got to know who she was um, and hear all the stories about um, my grandmother growing up. She used to wash my hair on Saturday night for Sunday church and tell me stories that she made up. And some of those stories would be stories about travels with Papa, and, and you'll see in the book, Blake's included, uh, when she and her sister traveled uh, with Papa, but they couldn't take Cotty because Cotty couldn't, wasn't light enough to be able to go and get food like they could. Um, mm -hmm. So she was, she wasn't uh, noticeably so, but, um, and he, he joked, he used to joke about having to wear a hat that he could pass if he wore a hat because his hair was not straight. <laughs> so right. um, she would tell me all those kinds of stories um, growing up. And, and then, uh, so, she used to say that Papa, somebody later, you know, after I was a teenager and maybe in college, she would say somebody should write about those times and Papa. And then my father thought it was also a good idea, seeing as he felt like he was walking in Aaron Moore's shoes in a way, um, following him as medical director of North Carolina Mutual and um, practicing in the hospital that Aaron Moore had founded. And dad was from, not from Durham, he was from Atlanta. So he came here uh, learning all that, uh, bringing his, his bride back to Durham who had thought she wouldn't ever have to come back here when he finally took her to the big city in Washington, DC. Hmm. So anyway, <laughs> all of those kind of, kind of family stories are just in my, my head and my being. And my husband and I came home and what really pushed me to seriously think about this was we would read the newspaper when I came back to Durham in 96 to work at Duke and the um, Black History Month newspapers would always bring an article about it, but there was always be mistakes. They wouldn't mm -hmm. understand that CeCe Spaulding was his nephew, not his cousin, you know, little things that I knew and I would write them and the next year the new journalist would not remember that I said that because the one that got my mem my note wasn't there anymore with all the turnover with local papers. Mm. And so my husband used to say, you should just get the book written. And I said, okay, well, got to figure it out, but I can't do it while I'm working full time. So I have to figure out how to focus on that fundraising and carry that process through. And it is a full, it was full time. Um, Blake is wonderful to work with. She's the creative genius. Um, you can put all of these facts in front of her and she makes, and she finds more, and then she turns them into a readable story. Um, and you think you're reading a novel almost, except that it is footnoted and has bibliography attached. So she's very careful, very creative, and we knew she'd be the right person to pull this off and dedicated and knew had her heart in it. So hiring any other writer wouldn't have worked. Um, it wouldn't have been the quality. That person wouldn't have had their heart in it. And and it's 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 more than I thought it would be. She's done a fabulous job with the book. So that's how it happened. <laughs> that, that's fantastic. I mean, the the part that sort of got my uh, excitement. You couldn't see it on my face, but it's it's happening inside. Is <laughs> the, the probably what most most people would consider boring is the footnotes, right? Which actually leads me into my next question about what are the archives that you all consulted? And I know this is kind of an inside question, but what are some of the archives that you all consulted um, while you were putting uh, the the biography together, uh, especially you know. Here at Duke, we have a number of dorm related collections. I know I saw you all many times in the reading room, but you know, tell me a little bit more about some of those collections and where uh, your research took you uh, to gather those materials. You want to start, Blake, or you want sure. to? Sure. I mean, we one of the very first uh, visits that we made was to you um, when I came. Uh, I made two larger research trips uh, to Durham. And the first one 
was making the the relationship and you know getting my logins and and getting uh introduced to to the rubenstein collection and and the john hope franklin collection and, and meeting you and and coming into that beautiful space um i i am very envious of those who get to work there uh day after day i think it's it's like a church of information it's just it's so exciting. Um, the the frustrated archaeologist in me just quivers um, with joy. Uh, as you can see, I, I found a, a library background because I'm obsessed with old libraries. So <laughs> you can see my my love for for books um, goes goes really deep. And so walking into that space and realizing, you know, that our family was you know, kept there uh, in in this honor honorific place. You know, things things that I remember being on my grandfather's desk, for instance, or mm. uh, books I remember seeing on the shelves, or photographs I remember seeing on the walls in family homes were there, in and and being kept with such care and such honor, and that makes you feel some type of way. <laughs> yeah. It makes you feel um, honored and and like part of a history in a way that I want for so many people. Uh, I want that that feeling for so many. And so it not only inflamed that passion in me to to find more and to and to delve into these collections to really encounter these artifacts um, and papers and words and 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 lives, uh, but also it it just was really a, an honor and a pleasure to walk into that space. So I want to thank you and all involved uh, and Rachel and, and all involved in keeping that space because you know if history is written by the victors, then y'all are already victorious um, because it's it's being held and and beautifully um and we need more <laughs> we need more spaces like this so when we entered that space that that was that was an extraordinary moment um and actually further down the road uh we had an extraordinary moment um when i was able to cross-reference um the cc spaulding papers with aaron moore's uh, what is what is there of aaron moore's most of which came through cc spaulding or John Merrick, um, and a, a little bit from my grandfather and his papers, uh, Dr. Charles Watts. So we found in CeCe Spaulding's papers, a box that had a file in it that was just labeled Aaron's book. And uh, here it is actually. Um, and we didn't know what that was, um, but I just had a feeling, I just had a feeling about it. And so I uh, asked you all to, pull that box aside for us. And I asked Eileen to find some time in her day, a couple of visits it looked at, it turns out it, it took um, to, to go and, and go through all of those those boxes and to find this file down in, in the box and, and out came this extraordinary thing, which turns out to be Aaron Moore's visiting book from the very first year of his uh, time as a practicing physician in Durham, his first year of medicine. This is the foundation of black medicine in Durham mm -hmm. in his handwriting on these pages. Wow. And you can see who he saw, uh, what they paid him, what he treated them for. You know, if they're crossed out, the he is either, you know, finished with the, the exam, or I think it's also he crosses them out when, he, when they're the exams paid for. Uh, you can see the the crescendo of his operations because at the beginning, it's really neat and and organized and and just a few visits. And by the end, as you can see here, the pages are cluttered and and a little bit chaotic. And you can tell he's in a hurry. Um, you can see how he presses the pencil into the page. Uh, it's just it's just the most marvelous thing. And there it was in inside your walls um, just waiting for us to find and uh, maybe Eileen can tell you what it's like to hold it because I haven't held it yet. Uh, 
COVID has prevented me from holding it in my own hands, but but Eileen will tell you what it was like to, to find well, it. You know, I had been in that box a couple of times, not necessarily looking for that file because I hadn't seen that file. The way it's filed, John, is it's a smaller, oh, it's a shorter folder. Okay. It's, you know, you have the big, um, eight and a half by, I guess the 14 inch ones. Yeah, the, the legal size folders. So the whole box is full of legal size files. And mm -hmm. this one is, must be an eight and a half by 11 one that's down lower. It's not up at the top where those are either. So that name, that file name, of course, Aaron's book, I'm not sure I would have thought about going in it anyway, but I did think I had gone in every folder. What I found uh, while doing that was a lot of pictures of family who didn't have, hadn't had names on them, like my Aunt Party, her name, I said, that's Aunt Party. So I was mm -hmm. writing notes on, this was Aaron Moore, uh, John Merrick's daughter, her picture was in it. Um, so I would write notes to your, um, the staff there at the library, you know, they let you put a little paper in there and write a note on it and say what you think it is. Well, I was sure who I wrote on there. So I was hoping those got fixed. And then I, I thought I was done with that box and Blake had found the name of the file on the internet on the directory. And she said, just go see what that is. So I did and I found it. I just said, she saw it, so it's gotta be here. So I'm dig digging and I pulled it out. And when I touched it, I was just shivering because mm -hmm. his fingerprints are there and it's soft leather and I, I you can smell human you can you know it's him yeah. we joked we said maybe it was blood on it we don't know but it, it was the kind of thing that the closest i ever got to him right because he yeah. passed in 1923 mm -hmm. and there he was and it, it's really his handwriting it's definitely a doctor's handwriting you really have to try to figure out what it is um <laughs> what he's saying but it, it is, it, you can figure it out. And Blake, so what I, I love about your library is that you can scan and email from the scanner, as, you know, and you can even get a pretty high resolution from that machine that's in the room where you are, which is mm -hmm. a huge asset. And so I would scan, I scanned every folded out page of it and sent it to Blake, emailed it directly to her and to myself so that then she, of course, dug down and, and really started looking. But we realized this is first full year of practice in 1889. And, um, and he was seeing a lot of people and he was doing a lot of things and he was getting paid 50 cents or maybe chickens and eggs or mm. fruit. <laughs> so, it, or maybe was, not at all, you know, some of them. All. Yeah, often not at all. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's, it's an extraordinary artifact. It just is. Um, and, and, you know, so many things came together in order for us to find this, right? The, the mm -hmm. person who put this on the, you know, online archive, the person who, who archived it in the box, the person who put that box in a place where it can be found. I mean, this is what, this is a triumph of, of, of research and of preservation and of you know historical uh, archiving that that you brought our our family back to us um, by by keeping this safe for us until we could hold it again and mm -hmm. that's that's what that's what this is that's the beauty of what this is that is the the, the collaboration that came together from all of you. Um, that that gave that moment to us, and I'll just be forever, forever grateful. Thank you. Well, I I, I appreciate it, and, and certainly on behalf of of my many colleagues in the Rubenstein, I think I, I can speak for them that you know we we love to hear stories like this. Um, you you had what I I call a close encounter, right? With yes, with history. Mm -hmm. But I will say that. One thing that I, when I speak with, with folks in my role as a curator is I often talk to them about how important it is for the creator or the family to have in their minds that this material is worthy of being saved, right? And so really the first step in that process is the Spalding family 
you know, the Watts family, your, um, you know, the generations that come before you and say, no, this is important and we want to make sure it's preserved, right? And then at that point, once it's handed over to us or any archive anywhere, um, it's inhinged upon us to make sure that people can access and put their hands on it, right? But I want to give the credit to your family, right? Because had, well, had I, no one come along and said, this needs to be saved. Well, then, I want to say, yeah. can I say that sure. this actually the credit of North Carolina Mutual. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the North Carolina Mutual company in its heyday um, hired a uh, staff archivist. Um, they had a quarterly newspaper uh, newsletter that went out to all of the agents and everybody involved in the in the company. That I knew, I knew the woman who who was their editor, um, uh, Mrs. Wade, uh, Alma Ruth Wade. Her her son was in my class at Hillside, um, so she was responsible for that PR piece of this big company. I mean, it was a huge company. People yeah. don't realize that it was the largest, you say, okay, it was the largest African-American company in the United States at one point. And because they then had, you know, budget for things like saving their family, their company history. So what you have there is really in those boxes is company history that we just happen to be related to. Mm -hmm. um, so the speeches of, of um, uh, C.C. Spaulding, um, I, I read uh, John Avery, you know, John Avery Boys Club. Yes, yeah. John Avery was first hired at the Mutual to teach and write speeches for the guys, Moore, Merrick. And he, he was the person, I forgot where he came from, I'm not doing him justice but he came to Durham with the capacity of writing speeches and designing uh, the PR for, for this startup company. So that picture um, that you have, actually, we got it from, from your collection and put it in the book. It's uh, um, Aaron Moore, they're sitting around a desk um, on a, in their first offices, which was actually Aaron Moore's office where they had the front room as their place where they gathered. So it was Moore, it was John Avery, it was his, as John, uh, Ed Merrick was there, and Aaron Moore, and John, I'll get it right, John Merrick. So Merrick was on the right, Moore was on the left, Avery was behind them, and it was before C.C. Spaulding, he wasn't in that picture. Um, and the other piece that Aaron, uh, John Avery did was so Ed, my granddaddy, had left Durham and gone to A&T and finished A&T mm -hmm. and came back home to work at North Carolina Mutual. So that was the only job he ever had after college. And probably before college, he was working at the Mutual, you know, busboy or moving papers around or doing something to be busy. So after he came back, he was to open up the Atlanta offices for them. And Avery was sent with him to be the person who kind of showed him the ropes. So, you know, when you, we think of his, his history is not really written in one place. And I would love to do that because everybody in Durham knows about the John Avery Boys Club and he's not yeah. a relative, he's, we're, we're not related. Yeah. Um, and that's the other sort of mystique of the mutual that everybody was related. And that's not absolutely, absolutely not true. People came to Durham for a better life to be in a business, to have an entrepreneur, to work in an entrepreneurial black business and learn about insurance or having learned insurance from other smaller insurance companies that they eventually um, brought, bought and merged with to grow the company. So there were a lot of people who were working at the mutual who weren't relatives. So that what you have there is the mutuals selection, uh, the mutuals papers that they very carefully took care of. And we're lucky to be related to the founders. And, yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's definitely clear that, that you all have done the research on this. And I'm wondering, were there things that you found that you didn't put in the book 
because either because you couldn't, you know, space constraints, you know, as soon as it gets in the hands of editors, God bless editors, you know, but, you know, naturally some things aren't going to be able to make it. So what are the things that you found that you were really excited about um, that, you know, did not make it into the book? I think that there were, uh, it's, it would be more like there were avenues I was unable to follow all the way down the road um, because I needed to stay as tightly to his, uh, the trajectory of his life as possible. Um, and this was a man who touched so many lives and who was um, involved with and consulted with so many other uh, Black leaders at the time and in his travels, that there were so many intersection points that would be interesting to see what, what transpired because of those intersection points. One of those areas wa uh, was his travel to Haiti and Cuba and uh, Puerto Rico. And he, he took several trips um, and, and he was able to found a, a missionary center um, with the White Rock Baptist Church in Haiti um, that was a bit of a job training center, a little bit of a medical clinic and a little bit of a school as well as a church. Um, mm. And that that was able to survive, but there were some political movements at the time, um, particularly the US occupation uh, that were a little bit tricky uh, politically, and at the same time, there was also this movement of Black folks feeling like having achieved a certain amount of, of, of middle class status, feeling like a, an, an important component of that was philanthropy, you know, to feel that they could influence, not influence, but, but they could uplift other Black communities through uh, sharing their entrepreneurism, their uh, uh, infrastructural development, um, how they did what they did to get where they are. There was this feeling that, you know, you, you are, you are not truly prosperous until you have shared your, your knowledge and your, and your treasure and your influence in the sense of being uplifting to other black communities. And yeah. that was true in inside uh, national borders, and it was true exterior to national borders. W.B. Du Bois, in fact, was quite uh, involved in, you know, traveling to other uh, Black nations or Black communities within nations, and not only finding out what their experience was like, but also imparting, you know, his particular, you know, philosophy of citizenship and of personhood and of mm. um, ensoulment of, of the citizen uh, from a black perspective and, and kind of building out what it was to be, you know, a black person in, in the context of history, in the context of art and culture and, and filling out the fullness of that culture. And I think Dr. Moore was really of that mind as well and would have done more of that work. I think had he had been able to get away to do it, he really loved to travel. He really loved to, to find, out about other people and what they were up to and how they were succeeding and how he could assist them in succeeding. So there were some trips that I would have loved to have drilled way down on and just even written a whole chapter on some of these trips. And I mm -hmm. thought, well, maybe this is a this is a an article for another day, but to keep, you know, to keep the story slim and and moving forward um, and not be too tangential and and not follow the rabbit down the rabbit hole of research is mm. always a researcher's uh, uh, Tim, Tim. mantra is to yeah. not not follow the rabbit. <laughs> well, I think we that, you know, six years or seven years, I guess five years of research, mm. we mm -hmm. had to get to a point where people were saying, oh, are you really going to do this book? I mean, you know, yes, money and people were expecting a book and they were seeing essays. And so it was like, okay, we have to decide that we've done what we can do. And if we have a publisher that we've interested in it, let's go with that. Mm -hmm. And let's, let's bring closure because it took um, two years after we, we presented and we, we presented 
a beautiful manuscript. I still have that copy. Um, but UNC Press said, well, we know this is going to be wonderful, but we'd like for you to do X, Y, Z. Yeah. And so we had another year of going back. And that's actually when I found some more things. I found uh -huh. over at the state, state archives, I started following the rabbit hole about his uh, rural schools movement. I wanted to see what he had really done. I had seen um, Joanne Abel's thesis and I knew there was that was the school movement and how he had convinced people to um, do what they had to do to match what the Rosenwald Fund was going to require. But I really enjoyed going over to the archives there and there was a person there, uh, one of the um, staff who said to me, well, you probably really want to look at the school board box. And I didn't know how to ask for that box. That person was very helpful. And he said, I'll pull it for you. I'll get it for you. And next time you come, it'll be here. And I was there the very next day. <laughs> um, it was just the state school board box with all this correspondence back and forth between him and legislators and school board members who um, and Blake has um, transcribed some of the letters in, in this book, in our book, where they did not know, they, they addressed him rudely. They, caught, they had conversations between them. Who is this darkie? What's he up to? You know, and, and um, all he was trying to do was document the fact he had paid an investigator to travel all over the state and document already that what at what there really weren't schools in the rural communities that black kids could go to and this uh, person he paid the inspector out of his pocket to give him data he took the data and went to the school board and the uh, legislature and said these kids are not being educated there are no schools why aren't there but guess what there's rosenwald money if you help match it you don't have to pay for the whole thing because you can get the match from the Rosewall Fund. But it was it was two it was five years, right, Blake? Yeah. Finally, he was able to convince them to do that. And well, uh, and he he very diplomatically and actively okay. called them on their rhetoric. Their right. rhetoric was, we don't see anything wrong with you know mm -hmm. equal distribution of of educational funding. Um, we don't mm -hmm. see anything wrong with what's going on. All of this is just a kerfuffle. And he went out and got that data. You know, we educate our in in words. What do you yes. talk about? And it's exactly. there, anyway, they don't have quality teachers. Well, they don't even know. Yes. So he was serious about it, but he was courteous. He was more courteous than I would have been. <laughs> <laughs> well, he was he was courteous and he was relentless and he came from five different angles. I mean, we saw this when he got the hospital built. You know, he made sure that the people who who were going to make the decisions to to fund help him fund the hospital. You know, he made sure that their chauffeur, their cook, their barber, their anybody they ran into were like, "How's it going with that hospital?" You know, like he he very carefully made sure that the case was made from many directions, and he mm -hmm. did it deliberately, and he did it with great statesmanship. But he was relentless, and that's I think as his reputation built over time, when they knew that he was coming, you know, they got they got a little nervous because they knew that he was going to drill down on the problem um, mm -hmm. and not mm -hmm. and not take surface um, dismissals. Um, and he was going to do it with with great elegance and poise. And that was going to be hard to override with, you know, the angry Negro uh, uh, label. And he would sign those letters, yours and racial uplift. I'm like. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. So just to, just to kind of take one quick step back because we've been getting questions in, which means okay. folks are engaged yes. and loving everything that you all are saying. <laughs> um, I, I do want to, maybe this is on me as the moderator. We didn't frame Dr. Moore in his life first, right? That here's a man who was you know, born at, around the end of the Civil War in North, Eastern North Carolina, Columbus County, correct? Mm -hmm. Correct. Um, and then he uh, matriculates at Shaw University um, and 
initially he wanted to be a lawyer. Am I right about that? Or no, I'm actually sorry. an educator, a professor. An educator. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Wanted to be a professor, and but decides to shift and attend Leonard Medical School, right? Which is one of the few um, schools for African Americans to get into the medical profession. Right. Definitely. Definitely. Um, he was and, part of only the second class, and, and there were only six before him, so he was he was definitely part of a, a very early cadre. And that would have been in the 1880s, 90s? 1880, yeah, 1885, he arrived at Shaw. Okay, um, and then once he leaves Leonard, is that at the point where he settles in Durham at yeah, that point? Correct, yeah, okay. he, was, he okay. was invited right after he passed his... Uh, his state boards, which actually was only the second year that they were offered. Um, so board certification was, was a new thing as well, but he, he passed his state boards with flying colors and uh, uh, immediately arrived in Durham in 1888 to take up the position of, of Durham's only black position. Right, and, and he arrives in Durham in a, a historical moment where the city is, is particularly the black community in Durham is uh, beginning to propel in a direction that very few locations in the country really uh, could, right? Because he finds himself in this cadre of intellectuals, businessmen, um, and it's no no surprise then that even as the you know the only practicing you know physician in town that he finds himself in all these other different places in education in business because you know as du bois this talented tim theory espouses yeah. that you it's sort of his responsibility to ensure that african americans in the city um, have places where they can be nurtured mm -hmm. um, and excel i want to well, I, you can, and i Am I, I think I'm going to read your mind. I don't know. Yeah, I'm sure. Go ahead. <laughs> so um, he came with that experience. So Columbus County wasn't just the sticks. He had already been to normal school. He was, he grew up on the farm, yes, but they were businessmen. They, they made their livelihood, his family, enclave of thousands of acres, contiguous property. Um, made made their livelihood at first with turpentine sales and traveling to sell that turpentine, uh, collect it and travel and sell it on the train. Um, so they had houses. They you know were a community that had churches. They had a Baptist church. They had two or three churches. So they um, they understood some some rudimentary health care and definitely education. He was the child who edu who taught the younger kids when he was in, in the one room schoolhouse. And then he left and he went to the normal school where he sort of was mentored by um, a carpetbagger white person who came down to teach the young men and kept them uh, moving forward with their education. But his cousin was John George Henry White who had already was had went to Howard and had uh, left left Columbus County and graduated from Howard University Law School and was the uh, legislature in the state in the US Congress. So he had models of people who had, were doing more than what he saw when he came to Durham. He came with in his mind what he could do to help this, mm. or this group to um, have better lives. He would bring them medicine, he would bring them uh, waste, and, and he joined White Rock Church and got to know people there. And at first they didn't want a black position because they weren't used to that. They thought they might be quacks, right? So he had to kind right. of convince people that he was capable of doing that. But, but um, Durham really wasn't anywhere near the kind of community at that point. It was ma it was mainly people who were coming here uh, to work in the tobacco farm, tobacco warehouses, the black people. Well, in, in many ways, actually, the, the places where he was educated before he came to Durham were really um, exciting and leading edge spaces, um, particularly Shaw, because 
uh, and, and particularly Leonard Medical School, because medicine itself was in its nascent stage as well. Mm-hmm. I mean, really only, you know, five to 10 years earlier, medicine was largely, you know, diuretics, leeches and, and opiates um, and, and not much else. We, we hadn't even gotten to, uh, you know, hygiene issues. It really, at where he entered the medical profession was where we start, started, you know, dealing with germ theory, dealing with antiseptic surgery, dealing with, um, you know, being able to study in a cadaver lab was only years old as, as even being legal because many in many states it wasn't legal. Uh, so really medicine itself was this leading edge space. And then he was in uh, under the guidance of um, white physicians who took a lot of heat for educating uh, black physicians, many who believed, many white physicians believed they couldn't learn uh, uh, medicine, but also believed that they shouldn't learn the, the secrets uh, of the trade either. Uh, and so th- these were also somewhat pioneering and, and brave educators as well that he spent his time with who treated him as an equal and treated him as a colleague um, and, and were so throughout his life. And then also while he was at Leonard, he founded the Old North, uh, Old North State Medical Association with some of his uh, classmates from the first uh, cadre of medical students, mm-hmm. um, including uh, Manasseh T. Pope, um, and one of the archives we really uh, used were, was the Pope House in in Raleigh, as well as the Shaw archives to really document this leading edge space. And so he came to Durham and and came to Durham at John Merrick's behest to kind of join this and to move forward with this new world vision of the fact that that you can build build communities from the ground up and you can be a founder wherever you look um, and and be thinking with a founder's mindset. And so when he was going into people's homes in that first year of medicine that we see in the book, um, he was he was doing, you know, research. He was he was creating the data uh, for what people needed and for and for where people's health care and also social needs were falling short and what they needed to, to be once again, have dignity and personhood and citizenship and and you know hope, and so that's so he came with that mind frame. He came from that 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 mindset. He had uh, people to look to who who were working that way in the world, and and he had this little window of time in which in America in Reconstruction we really tried to you know or we said we were going to try to get it right, even though that window slammed shut pretty shortly after he left university. Uh, and he began to see that that window wasn't going to open again for a lot, a lot of time, but he spent the rest of his life trying to open that window for as many others like himself um, mm. uh, that he could. Yeah, he talks about, they talk, I mean, his wife, when once they were married, her duties were to kind of teach the women how to do things like make soap and how to put a sneak mosquito netting up. There was a whole a whole group of people who were um, migrating to Durham without those kinds of skills, having come from, um, you know, slave situations or tenant farming situations all over the state, because there was there were tobacco factories and there was work there. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think- Food he- preservation and, and, and food preparation you know, were big too, you know, not eating spoiled food, um, being able to, to keep your food uh, from spoiling, uh, that, you know, proper nutrition so that you're not getting uh, nutritional deficiencies, just lots lots and lots of issues. Right. And so another one of the questions was the book that you all found, was he practicing at the hospital at that point or was he practicing out of his home? No, he practiced out of his home from for 20 years. <laughs> yeah. he, the he, home was the hospital. The home was uh, the first hospital. Of course, of course. He came in 1889 and he did not found Lincoln Hospital until 1901. Mm-hmm. Okay. And he had to scuffle around to find philanthropy to help fund, help him be able to build that hospital. And so when people say that 
Washington Duke gave them money. Washington Duke was encouraged to be a philanthropist in that direction versus building a monument. But mm -hmm. it was not in his mind to do that. His his own doctor, his his maid, and people around him convinced him that the black people on the black side of town needed a hospital. Some people were self-serving in that. They wanted us to have one because they weren't going to help us on their hospital. Watts Hospital was there, and we couldn't go there. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we needed one. So it was it was not all. Um, positive reasoning, it was some self-serving reasons for that. that well, and, and it's also overlooked that a tremendous amount of Black philanthropy also, you know, was part of that project. You know, people in Durham's Haiti contributed to, um, if they didn't contribute yeah. in dollars, they contributed in, you know, volunteerism. I mean, the women's groups that surrounded Lincoln Hospital, mm -hmm. for instance, were mm -hmm. its volunteer engine. Mm -hmm. And that was the first hospital, You there were two. The second one is the one I was born in and that was a brick five-story building on Fayetteville Street that's near Lincoln Community Health Center now. But the first one was on Fayetteville Street um, and Proctor Street and it was yes. a white um, clapboard place that had also a nursing school was started behind it at the same time or a year later. And that had a fire and burned down so he was planning this new building when he was on when he was dying. He never saw the new brick, um, four five story building when he was. Wow. Yeah. But um, my my his so John Merrick's baby girl, <laughs> who was Martha Martha Merrick Donnell, was married to Clyde Donnell, who was actually. Um, Aaron Moore's doctor by then, and he had come here from Harvard training. And yeah, he, he was, signed his death certificate. Yeah, he signed the death certificate, and he was all the he was then became the medical director at North Carolina Mutual, following in Moore's footsteps. And he was still living when I was little. I mean, I remember him very well and his wife. Um, so, and my father actually followed Donnell to be the medical director. So when Donnell retired, dad became medical director at North Carolina Mutual. And somebody asked me too, not too long ago, so your father was a surgeon. So why was he also medical director of North Carolina Mutual? And why at one point was he also the health, the director of the health services at NCCU? And I'm like, think about it. <laughs> Doctors were not working for a lot of money. He needed to have a way to survive. Wow. He didn't have insurance, right? He was um, he got insurance by working at at North Carolina Mutual, um, so he was he was an entrepreneur, self self sustaining kind of position. Nothing like what new doctors these days, yeah, who you know finish and get to be a fellow, and then they get to be you know or an attending, and they're it's very different. Well, I mean, you we, you saw that in the the book that we shared, right? That he was being paid fifty cents yeah. here, a chicken there. I think that was maybe not. for dad, and yeah. some, you know, he felt good about helping people, and so he would just do it because the per, it, it's a it's a profession that you see somebody that needs help and you can help them, then you do. Um, so. So we got some really great questions coming in in the chat. Yeah, so we I, have I so many questions. Encourage <laughs> uh, folks to, to use the, the Q and A. So let me let me just ask one more question, and then I'll get to uh, the other ones. And I think maybe this will help kind of tie in uh, to, to what we'll lead into. So yeah, we have a, a fairly large audience of folks who are involved in libraries and archives, and okay. you know the information science fields and everything. Is it? there anything that you would like for them to know about sort of your process, um, helpful tips along the way that, and Eileen, I know you were, you were giving us tips on how to better describe some things. So just anything that you want to share. I will just start by saying that I was able to largely do my portion of the research and to, you know, reference my research entirely online during this process because I live in Los Angeles and have been very distant from the physical locations of a lot of, of all of this. And I certainly would have loved to have been a writer in residence, but that was 
that was not how how it panned out. Um, and so I want to just say that all of the online resources really make this kind of writing and this kind of research and this kind of um, reanimation of black stories and black lives into the historical narrative more possible than ever. And, and I just want to encourage anyone who isn't a researcher to really give it a try because it's such a, it really is quite user friendly. Um, her um, so many layers and Wi Fi is to what is out there and available. Your oh. Wi Fi is dragging. I'm speaking, here I am speaking about online things. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> No, but so speaking about online things and, and, and my Wi Fi is is out. But the, the accessibility of having online materials is, has been really critical, especially in, in this and in, not only in your case being a, a resident in California, but just in the moment that we're in now where um, you know, a lot of archives and collections aren't accessible because of COVID protocols and, and whatnot. So having more materials online has been really helpful. Um, yeah, I don't think it's going truly. back. <laughs> no, I, I, I think we uh, the toothpaste is out of the tube at this point. Uh, exactly. And that's okay. That's okay. That's um, it, it, that just makes all of our jobs even more exciting. So uh, one of the questions that came in was, uh, uh, someone was wondering, how did uh, Dr. Moore balance his life? I mean, he had his hands in so many things, being a professional, <laughs> being an activist, um, being involved in education, uh, his family relationships. So how did he balance all that? Were there stories that you were able to unearth about that? And well, he, he's also doing this in, in the, you know, the prime of Jim Crow, right? Let's not right. overlook that. And we, we, we talked about it, but I mean, this is a time period where the, the mobility of African-Americans, both physically, societally, economically is limited, right? So how did he, he navigate that world? I think that's a good think in the book where you you, you um, talk about the um, education conference where he was finally getting the um, uh, word to the population, to the community that they were going to get the Rosenwald schools. And he left the conference that, at, that evening for his six o'clock beginning of his daughter's wedding. He walked her down the aisle. They had a big party with all kinds of people, the governor and the mayor and all these people were there, it was written up in the New York Times. And then the next morning he went back to that conference. Mm -hmm. So he did what he had to do, what he felt best to do. But it sounds like to he he took care, he, he didn't rest enough, but he made a point of resting and reflecting and reading the Bible every day, every morning to start with um, and um, I think he he ended up having heart heart um, congestive heart failure, but he was basically managing his life with, you know, in in compartmentalizing it, and kind of doing what he felt needed to be done when it needed to be done. He'd see an idea and he'd start on it and get get it done. You know, let's 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 create a pharmacy so the kids at NCCU can have. Um, experience, you know, experience in working in a pharmacy when they're in school. Let's do, let's have a symphony. Let's have, you know, but he gave time to his family, their letters. Um, obviously my grandmother loved him. They, they sent the girls away to, to school. Both, both daughters were away in boarding school for high school and for college. They went to Barbara Scotia um, for um, high school, and then they went to Fisk for college. And so during the times that the girls were away, he missed them. He talks about, you know, can't wait till the girls are back home so then we can do X, Y, Z. But when you don't have your children around, you do have more time to do more things in the community. So, and, and I think a lot, I think a lot of uh, how he felt about his family is encapsulated in some of his final letters. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, his beautiful letter to to Cotty, where he said, you know, if, if there were more wives like you, the prisons would be empty and the churches would be full. 
Mm. And, uh, and that you were always the girl, just the girl that I needed. Um, and also his letter to his daughter, Lida, my, my great, great grandmother, um, saying, you know, spend more time with your family because I, um, I, I worked this hard to what he, we call, he called it laying the mud sills of the race, laying the mm -hmm. foundation of the race um, so that now you can work a little less hard and maybe spend more time with your family. Um, I sacrificed that uh, and I know I did, but, but this work had to be done. And so you can tell there's some melancholy there for the times mm -hmm. that he missed, but also tremendous pride that he did what he felt he needed to do. And I think also when you hear Lida talk about him, there was an atmosphere in that family of service. Mm -hmm. And so in many ways, like we see, for instance, in military families, there's just an idea that there is a greater goal, a greater mission that this whole family is, is pointed at. And so we all, you know, maintain that level of, of service consciousness. And we, we do our part. We don't ask for too much. We know we're loved. And we know that, that, that the goal of the family is not only for us to, to love each other, but for our family to love our community. And that was definitely instilled in, in the family dynamic. So that, that there was, there was always that feeling. Right. So um, another one of the questions that came in was, uh, were there any stories about what black medicine looked like in Durham during Dr. Moore's time? I know you mentioned, you know, him opening a pharmacy. Did he have a cohort or, you know, colleagues that he was close with? Um, so what did that look like during that time period? Initially, it just looked like him on a horse <laughs> showing up and, and seeing what people needed. Um, and, and then on a bicycle. Um, right. But eventually, yes, he, he, he was able to, to uh, I mean, Lincoln Hospital was about being a teaching hospital and being a nursing school and, and building black medicine, you know, as an institution and not just as a care service. Um, so he was always, uh, you know, recruiting whoever he could recruit to, to be part of the care. Uh, and that, that meant volunteers as well. Many of the women's clubs well, rolled bandages and washed sheets and made soap and uh, uh, did well baby visits after somebody came home from the hospital and delivered their baby. Um, they, they would go and, and teach, you know, uh, child, child care and, and well baby uh, lessons um, and look after each other or, or if someone was in the hospital, they would check in on the family who were still remaining at home. So there was a lot of community um, uh, organizing that really Cotty Moore uh, led in it more than he, even he did. I think he left that very much with her. Um, and he, then- He stayed in yeah. touch with his, his colleagues at Shaw. Yes. He went back and forth uh, with professors as well as other uh, classes behind him. Um, Stanley uh -huh. Bell Warren, who the library is named after, he was a physician who came here after um, Moore. They both finished Shaw. He was a couple of years after Moore and came and opened up a practice here as well. So by the time there was a Lincoln Hospital, that would, would be a magnet for others yes. to, to come where there weren't hospitals other places. Even in the 50s and 60s, there, you know, all around uh, in Rocky Mount and in other places in, in North Carolina where there wasn't a hospital that Blacks could go to for surgery, people were coming to Durham. And that's why Durham was such, you, you see a population of Durham increasing with um, a professional level. And nurses, the nursing school attracted women from all over the, the state who, yeah, yeah got their bachelor's, their, their diploma first, and then their bachelor's at NCCU. And they stayed here and they had families and they, uh, you know, gave back to the community a lot as well. But it's important to, re to realize that all of that grew out of him on a horse or right. him on his back porch pulling teeth yeah. or sewing up wounds at all hours on the kitchen table mm -hmm. uh, and Cotty sterilizing instruments. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, him keeping infectious disease patients on a, on a screened in porch, um, uh, him, you know, 
bringing bringing firewood to to people as as well as some food so that they could recuperate from whatever he was treating them uh, for. You know, him making visits to the factories to advocate for better factory uh, uh, floor uh, conditions because there were so many diseases that were emanating from that. Him, you know, advocating for uh, pellagra, which was a spoiled corn related um, uh, nutritional deficiency to, to be, you know, dealt with. So there's just, it really began with one man who was everything from, you know, to right. coroner to forensic uh, science. You know, he, he was showing up at, at the scenes of fires or uh, of murders of, you know, any kind of event. Um, he was, you know, really at the heart of everything. He, he was much more like a battlefield medic than he was mm. um, like a, a nice country doctor uh, mm. for a while. And then I think the, the nice country doctor life came along and then finally the really state of the art hospital uh, professional life where he was growing the profession. So it really came in stages. Uh -huh. So, um, okay. That shows that he was starting from the ground up literally. Um, literally. Uh, so the, the next question is about Dr. Moore's role in World War I and really either he or C.C. Spaulding or John Merrick, what was, I guess the role of that uh, level of leadership during World War One, particularly in Durham. Um, I'll let you take his, it. Sure. His his role mostly during World War One was was holding down the home front, uh, particularly around um, professional uh, security. He was something called a, a dollar a year man which was a, a government, he, he, he represented the government basically for black labor during that time, advocating for them to have better conditions because, uh, because of, of, of labor forces being depleted, not only by war, but also by attrition. People were, black people were moving away uh, and, they, and, and white, particularly white employers and particularly in the factory, uh, realm were wanting to know what they could do to maybe persuade them to not do that because skilled labor was really important. And Dr. Moore became an advocate, a labor advocate during that time uh, as, as, a, as a representative of the US government, but in particular, a representative of uh, black workers of his area. Um, he did that. He definitely kept in touch with uh, colleagues who were medically involved on the battlefield. I think uh, he had real interest in, in what was going on. He did have a few colleagues overseas who he had a correspondence with um, around that. Uh, he was very concerned, particularly with the plight of soldiers who were returning uh, and reintegrating in, into society safely because there were a tremendous amount of lynchings of uh, soldiers who returned in, in uniform. And mm -hmm. there were there were definitely uh, social issues surrounding that that I think he was pretty involved in interceding or uh, or facilitating homecomings uh, into the community and and uh, employment etc to get people resettled. Okay, uh, I see we have one person who has their hand raised. I'm gonna. Uh, Miss Blumenthal, I believe is her name. We allow her to talk if that's okay. Uh, getting ready to wrap up. That was an accident. Okay. I've okay. enjoyed this very much, but I I got a little lost entering, and it's probably a leftover from my trying to get in. Oh, and I'm no we're just so happy to get to say hello in person. Hello. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> we'll wave back. Okay. Thank <laughs> you. I'm seeing someone asking to be let in. Did you have to let people in? There's an Arthur Clement who would love to. Okay, I'll I'll let Mr. Clement, uh, and then he'll get the last last question. Okay, I'll, I'll introduce him while he's thinking of his question. Sure. <laughs> so Arthur Clement, Mr. Clement, yeah, one of the children of 
Josephine Clement that you guys, many of you know about from the school at uh, NCCU, um, but you also know about her from her community work. She was the first African-American woman in Durham to be uh, elected to the school board. And, um, and among other things, she's, uh, and so Arthur Art Clement is her um, youngest son who actually lives in Atlanta and sometimes California. Art, do you wanna say anything? Can you hear me? We can. Yes. All right, but I don't have audio, I guess. Um, so I'm sorry I got in late, but um, uh, I was uh, got I was off another getting off another call. But I certainly wanted to join in and learn more. I do want to order the book. I haven't had a chance to do that. Um, I grew up. Uh, I guess the Clement family and the Watts family were very close, and. Um, my older brother, Wesley, was along with you, correct, Eileen? He was a year older. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> yeah. I grew up along with Debbie. And then uh, my sister, Kathy, grew up with Chuck. That's right. And then my youngest sister, Jody, grew up with Winnie. Exactly. Right. right. So. And I remember your family very well as, right. as, a, as a child coming through the kitchen. Right. Well, Blake, I don't know if we've ever met before. It's a pleasure to meet you. And uh, Debbie was a dear childhood friend. We were in Jack and Jill's together and uh, grew up. And I remember when she was at, uh, didn't she go to UNC uh, Greensboro? Yes. That's she what she did. Mm -hmm. uh, and she introduced me to a woman I dated my freshman year. I was at NC State. And back then, NC State was. Uh, was not co-ed, so that you know you had to leave the campus to go have a social life. <laughs> she introduced me to this young lady. I forget her name, uh, but we dated uh, that first year. I, I had to travel from Raleigh to Greensboro to have a social life. Wow, and wow! Then, she is always right here on my desk with me. Oh wow! So. Isn't that something? Yeah. yeah, that's my mama. Yeah. Thank you for bringing her name into this discussion today. She's always with us. That's good, right. Good. Well, I wanted to learn more about this. I had talked to Eileen uh, about a book, a biography I'm trying to write uh, on Phil Freelon, prominent African-American architect there in the Raleigh-Durham area. Yeah, knew and him and loved him. Published. I'm an architect, I'm used to drawing. And now I'm having to learn to write, so. It's quite a, uh, a change, but um, I am familiar somewhat with the story of uh, Moore, and I was curious, uh, you talked about his role and the fact that he went to Shaw in Raleigh, correct? Yes, yes, yes. Um, and, you know, Shaw also produced the first African-American architect, a fellow named uh, Gaston, hmm. so Gaston. And uh, it was a powerful institution back in those days. Um, it was. Yeah, in terms of educating African-Americans and attracting them to the area. And those cities that had these historically black colleges really attracted a different group of people, professionally trained people who stayed in the community, as you said. But Durham was unusual. And that's really what I wanted to hear, one of my stories, I mean, my questions was how did Durham get to be so unusual? I know Raleigh to a certain extent, um, but Durham had this unusual concentration of people of unusual well, background. Well, and Art, you know, you your dad that? was working for North Carolina Mutual. He came here because of that from Charleston. It, uh, so Durham attracted, it was a magnet because of North Carolina Mutual and the banks and the industry. Um, and then NCCU opened and was here. So mm -hmm. Durham began to attract a, a, a higher level of education, um, people wanting to become involved in the entrepreneurial businesses. Um, and it was also pretty calm considering the times. Mm -hmm. There was a yeah. better, a good relationship on both sides of the track where there was a symbiotic relationship, we think. There was a reason that we should be not hung and, and burned down like Wilmington was mm -hmm. because 
the workers were important for the factories and the textile mills. So um, it, we, we survived that, but then our buildings, our historic buildings didn't survive urban, urban removal, as we call it. Mm -hmm. uh, so somebody was asking me the other day, is there any building left in St. Joseph's Church, uh, which is now Haiti Heritage Center, is, is the oldest one of the Haiti buildings that's left. Mm -hmm. the, the library, Sampler Warren Library, can be, you can say it's the historic it is the historic Durham Colored Library, but it wasn't built until 1940. So we really um, do have that problem as far as uh, finding the buildings that you have to see pictures, you know? White Rock Church, where you went, is not here. Right. So. Well, and I, I think that Durham really, really uh, was a, an extraordinary combination of minds and I think all of those minds, uh, Black Germans especially, were aligned towards building this uh, experiment, et cetera, you know, in some senses, but also this very deliberate proof that given half a chance, Black people could do for themselves, uplift themselves, build something uh, beautiful and uh, dignified and lasting. Uh, and and also lucrative, and so uh, the more that that idea spread, and and the mutual is very responsible for that because there were so many agents spreading out across the nation, carrying right. this kind of dignity and this kind of personhood, and and citizenship with them, um, that that really rang true to a lot of people, and and they wanted to stay. And, and keep it safe and keep it moving forward. And it really did, you know, I, I think Eileen is a perfect example of someone who, you know, grew up with that feeling all around her. And I am, my generation feels that too. And the generations after me still have that, that feeling that that existed and that's in our, D, our DNA. And I know you, you feel that too. Um, it's in our DNA that that, that that not only happened, but that it was, it was a deliberate art form um, produced by a, a really extraordinary think tank of minds that came together and, and made that. So I think as we draw to a close today, um, I, I wanna uh, shoot it back to John here, um, but I wanna also just re reinforce the hope that is, is contained in uh, that model that when we invest in each other, when we uplift each other when we um, take every opportunity to to promote the dignity and and the personhood and the citizenship of 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 people and our neighbors uh, it is a it is good business it is good uh, and civilized uh, social living it is an enlightened society and it is what you know, we, we hear uh, our leaders like John Lewis refer to as the beloved community. I think they created the beloved community there for a minute and uh, we all are, are a result of it and we all want to see it come again. Yeah, that's thank you. Um, this, this program has been great. Uh, I really appreciate both of you for sharing the story. I want to give you all the last word and ask one simple question. Where can people get the book? <laughs> <laughs> well, get it at a black bookstore if you can. It's available um, at most bookstores. I know locally, the regulator bookshop has it. Um, and then I have them actually with a donation. So from the Durham Colored Library Inc. on our website, you make a donation of at a minimum $100 and you get a book or and any amount over $58 is tax deductible. And so, that book is signed by the author and with a signed. special commemorative book plate that includes uh, Dr. Moore's uh, 1916 passport photo, which uh, floated to the surface after the book was published and we wanted to include as a special gift um, along with my signature uh, mm -hmm. to those who, who are donors to, to the Durham Colored Library Inc which he founded and which all of the proceeds of the book benefit. Um, any, that's in, in very important to me. 
So I don't, I, it's okay to buy them from Amazon or bookstores or wherever, because in the end, the royalties come back to Durham Colored Library because Durham Colored yes. Library made the investment in having this, this book written. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, and I wanna thank everyone for joining us and taking the time out of their day to, to join us for this conversation. We really appreciate it. There is a recording that's been made of this um, and we will try to get that uploaded uh, soon, hopefully to the Duke University Library's YouTube page, but uh, be on the lookout for a link uh, to, to that. So I think with that, we will sign off and thanks again, everybody. Thank you, John. Thank you all. Good to hear from you. I see Burl Gilmore on here. Did you see her name? Yes. Yep. That's another. Thank you all who came more. and thank you for your questions. I'm sorry if we didn't get to all of them, but uh, uh, thank you for your engagement. I see you on the chat and uh, I, feel, I feel the love and the warmth. Thank you all. Okay. Bye-bye. Right. Take care. Thank you. Bye.